Uh, as, as Josh said, my name's Matt. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at the Elm City Vineyard. Um, you, I, I also am uh, a, a research faculty member at the Divinity School. And um, part of what I get to do there is I get to teach what I think, uh, I will say just unabashedly, I think is the best course at Yale. Um, I teach the Life Worth Living course. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, design it, so I get, I can, it's okay for me to say that I think it's the best course. Um, Ryan has to blush because uh, he did design it, and I, think it's, I still think it's the best course at Yale. And um, one of the amazing things, that, so we just talk about what makes life worth living all semester um, with students. We ask them, and we read some of the world's great traditions, religious traditions, non-religious philosophical traditions, and we're always asking, what is it that makes life worth living? And whenever I teach Life Worth Living, on the, on the final day, I end by uh, taking some time to tell students what I've learned from them uh, during this semester about what it is that makes uh, life worth living, what makes for a good life, a flourishing life. And then I leave them with one final thought. And this past spring, the final thought was this. I said, you know, being young, I think, is all about maximizing your options. But growing up, I think, means closing off options in order to commit to what really matters. For every yes, there are a thousand no's. And without those no's, the yeses are meaningless. It takes courage to say no to the good for the sake of the best. To say no to the easy for the sake of what is hard but better. To say no to what seems obvious to, in order to chase down what is only starting to kind of make itself known. Honestly, I think in our day, it takes courage to say no to just about anything. In our day, it takes serious courage to dare to focus. So as we continue our, our, our series on the art of neighboring, um, we're going to talk about this elusive art of focus. And I take it that this is something that's not only relevant for our thinking about what it would mean for us to love our neighbors well, but also uh, for our lives in general. Focus does not come naturally to us. There are distractions at every turn, from our phones to our calendars to the news, you name it. And we tell ourselves constantly that we really can and we ought to be doing more than one thing at a time. Multitasking, also known as lack of focus, is actually a prized skill. We, we try to learn this. We try to grow in this. We practice degrading our focus, trying to learn to live without a peace that maybe we've given up hope of ever finding. But still, I, I stand by my advice to my students because I've experienced it for myself. The most valuable things in life come only from being able to focus, being able to say no to other things for the sake of what matters most. My most meaningful friendships, my relationship with my daughter, my relationship with my wife, the nearly two decades that we've spent here in New Haven, every meaningful thing in my life has appeared at the cost of a thousand no's, a thousand roads not traveled, a thousand doors closed, a thousand opportunities left on the table. And my hunch is that if you take a moment to think about it, the same is true for you. So this afternoon, we're going to talk a bit about focus, about what it is, about what it costs, about why it's worth it, and how following Jesus into lives marked by focus can lead us to lives of deep purpose, rich relationships, and genuine love of our neighbors. Because as we'll see, Jesus' life was a life of focus, at times, ruthless focus, relentless focus, but ult ultimately, I take it, an abundant and fruitful life, in large part because he was able and willing to live with such focus. So this afternoon, we're going to see if we can't catch a glimpse of this focus and see if it might not be able to begin to kind of take hold in our own lives. As we do that, I, I, I want to pray for us. So if you uh, would pray with me. God, we are not a focused people. I am not a focused person. We just ask that for this time, in this moment, you would speak to us and you would give us a call worth focusing on. That you would bring clarity and quiet to our busy minds. 
Come and have your way. Amen. So ultimately, I, I, I promise that we are going to talk about what this all has to do with being good neighbors. But I actually want to start somewhere um, I think maybe more fundamental. Because like I said, I think focus hardly comes naturally to us. In fact, I think by disposition, most of us are ideologically opposed to focus. I, th I think this is especially true for those of us who are young, as I've kind of already hinted at. The most prized possessions of the young often are our opportunities, our options, where to live, what job to pursue, who to be with. It's part of our culture's larger obsession with choice, and regardless of age, there's an orthodoxy in our culture that says that more choice is always better. Big life-scale opportunities are the biggest choices of all, and so if bigger is better, biggest is best, and so we can tend to store up these big life-scale opportunities, and we can kind of hoard them. The key, we think, is to keep as many doors open as possible, because to close a door is to forfeit what we value most. This is, I think, life-sized FOMO. Is that, I don't know if that's still a thing that people say. My, I, I chase along behind culture, and then I end up, it's not a thing people say anymore. Fear of missing out, right? So this, this sense that there's, there's somewhere something going on, and by being here and doing this thing, I'm missing out. I can, economists, I take it, would call this opportunity cost. We weigh opportunity cost way too high, right? And we, it can become paralyzing. The result is that we can end up sort of living our lives only halfway. We want a given, what a given relationship could offer us, but we don't want to pay the cost of committing. And that's it, right? I think focus requires commitment, and often that's a price we're not willing to pay. And so we, can get, we get all that we can out of a relationship without commitment, and then we wonder why we're not satisfied. We want what a life deeply invested in a community or a particular place could offer us, but we don't want to make the commitment. We want to live a life of purpose, but we don't want to close off doors to possible career paths, because who knows what it is we're giving up on. Instead, we keep our options open. We actually end up blowing, blown by the wind, investing wherever we find initial success, giving ample evidence that we're actually more committed to approval than we are to vocation. And if the goal is to keep as many doors open as possible, the only way to do that is never walk through any, any of them. And since walking through any one door closes any number of others, stockpiling opportunities can only come at the cost of never realizing any opportunity, never really experiencing anything. It's the life experience equivalent of the greedy person who becomes so obsessed with money that he won't ever spend it, and so can never enjoy even the good things that money really could afford. It's a dead end. And Jesus gives us a diagnosis of this sort of life when he says to his friend Martha, who's busy tending to many things, even many important things, even many good things, he gives this diagnosis. He says, you are worried and distracted by many things, but only one thing is needed. This is the state of our lives, worried about many important things, distracted even by many good things, but Jesus says only one thing is necessary. Many of us this afternoon need to hear this spoken directly to us. Matt, you are worried and distracted by many things. Only one thing is necessary. Only one thing. And as terrified as we are of actually living a life of focus, of saying no to so many tantalizing opportunities that dance in our imaginations, perhaps in our desperation, we're willing to take the, ba take the bait. Okay, Jesus, fine. What is the one thing? I take it that Jesus names this one thing the source of his tremendous focus in one of the ancient accounts of his life in the Gospel of John in chapter 5. Jesus had just healed a man on the Sabbath, breaking a religious law, and he was asked to give an account of why he had done what he had done, and Jesus replied this way. He said, very truly I tell you, the son, he's talking about himself, the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. Now, Jesus is talking about himself in the third person for good reason. Um, <laughs> it can be a kind of odd thing when someone does this. But I, I think his point here is to emphasize that he has this kind of personal, wh wh where his personal identity lies, 
right? He, his identity is as one intrinsically related to God the Father. If God can be understood as a father, he can be understood as the son. And because of who he is, he isn't a free agent. Jesus' singular focus isn't a strategy. It's not a tip or a trick to help you design the life you always wanted. It's a fundamental truth about who Jesus is and who we're invited to be. The Son does only what he sees the Father doing. God, Jesus, and our Heavenly Father is busy at work. And so the Son of, uh, the, son of the Heavenly Father, um, Jesus is in, living in sync with what the Father is doing. He doesn't have to, have to live grasping for a future that could slip out of his hands. He doesn't have to live to prove himself. He begins each day, each moment with the knowledge that he is already beloved by his heavenly father before he even lives, lifts a finger. And so he's an invited into his father's work. His father's work looks like bringing peace, love, and joy into the world. In a few weeks, we'll actually start a series on the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Uh, Jesus is involved in his heavenly father's workshop, building the kingdom, the rule and reign of God in which the abundant life breaks into a world full of death. And every day, the one driving question is, Father God, what are you doing? How can I do what you are doing? How can I join in what you are doing? And I take it if we want to live in sync with who we really are, if we want to live as our authentic selves, as children of our Heavenly Father, no less related to God than Jesus is related to God through our relationship with Jesus, we need to do what we see our Father doing. And the result is a tremendous focus, the sort of single-mindedness that we just can't muster on our own. If we live as beloved children, gone is the need to take on a thousand things in order to prove ourselves worthy. If we live as children growing organically into the business of our Heavenly Father, as children learning to take over the family business, we can walk confidently into whatever peace, love, and joy the moment requires. If we can learn to live this way, we can conquer the fear of missing out. We can conquer opportunity cost once and for all and live lives of purpose, lives of focus. Honestly, it's become the single most impactful prayer of, of my life. Um, this, is what, this is the prayer that comes out when I don't mean for a prayer to come out. God, what, what are you doing? What are you doing in the world? If I'm just walking somewhere and I want to reconnect with God, this is the prayer that I pray. This is the, the sound of kind of the baseline. Because I, I want to cultivate an awareness of what God is doing so that, that my life, the focus of my life, can be turned in that direction. Now, fair warning. If you pray this prayer, God may answer it. <laughs> And he may, God may initiate all sorts of adventures uh, to take you to places you didn't expect to go because you start to see what God is doing and you start to take steps to partner with what God is already doing. And if you thought that you had kind of some, some wherewithal for yourself that you can actually make some things happen in the world, well, just wait until you start working in the same direction that the God who created the universe is working. Um, Effectiveness, right, is, is very different um, in that sort of direction. When the home group that eventually became this, this church um, was growing and growing, we actually started praying this prayer together. God, what are you doing here? Actually, the addition of the here at the end of this question is particularly powerful. You could try adding that, right? And what are you doing right here? What's happening? We see the people in the room. What is it that you're doing God's answer to this question eventually focused our energies around God's dreams for the Elm City Vineyard. Okay, so I, I think that's the big picture um, regarding the, 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 the focused life. Fo life becomes focused when we start living by asking what the Father is doing and then focusing our lives around what we hear. And not like just once and then like heading off headlong in the direction because we don't hear perfectly, but, but day by day, right? Father, what are you doing? What are you doing in this place? Who are you at work in? Where, where are you leading me? How can I be a part of the thing that you're already doing? And I promise this would have something to do with neighboring. All right.
I think one key way that we see this, this issue of focus play out is actually in relations, relationships. Uh, apart from Jesus' focus on the one thing, what the Father is doing, um, I, I, I take it that relational fear of missing out can be a huge factor in our lives. Whether in the romantic arena where we're searching desperately to find that one perfect mate and optimize our most important consumer choice, if that's how we think about dating, or in the realm of professional relationships looking to acquire the most advantageous set of connections to grow our career in whatever direction we might someday want to go, or whether it's simply in the, in the realm of friendship where perhaps we've learned to keep our options open so that we're prepared for the eventuality of people leaving us for a job or a romantic relationship of their own or whatever else. We can find ourselves relationally anxious, stockpiling possible relationships or opportunities. We don't know how to commit, and we find ourselves with hundreds of Facebook friends, connections on LinkedIn, but few, if any, people that, who we can call when we need genuine friendship. Jesus' focus points in another direction. And then the first thing, of course, just to point out is, of course, he affirms that people are, in some sense, a bullseye of the one thing. What is God doing in the world? What God is doing in the world and bringing peace and love and joy into the world, bringing the kingdom of God, it's all about people. It's all about relating to people. And Jesus tells crazy stories about, hey, you, you think that money in your pocket is useful. What if you could use that money in order to buy friends? He basically endorses this idea. The, the point being, look, if, if there are things that are valuable in your life, the most valuable thing actually are people, relationships. So if you're wondering kind of where to start, if you're kind of learning to hear the voice of God, what is the Father doing? Well, he's at work in the people around you. Maybe more so than in your accomplishments or your bank account or some of the other things that can get us distracted. But Jesus also demonstrates the ability to focus his relational energy, and he does this to great effect. Surrounded by crowds who clamored for his attention, he nevertheless surrounded himself with concentric circles of increasingly intimate relationship. When he needed to send a sizable but dependable advanced team ahead of him as began the heart of his ministry, he worked with a select group of 70 disciples who had been traveling with him. But of course, he focused his relational time most of all on 12 disciples with whom he ate, drank, slept, and lived his life. And even within that group of the 12, there were three disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were with Jesus in even more intimate environments on top of the mountain where he was transfigured and interacted with the great men of faith, Moses and Elijah. These were the three who went with him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was about to be betrayed to death, these were the ones closest to him, those in whom he invested the most relational time and energy. And make, make no mistake, Jesus, uh, I believe, is, is God, related to God, but uh, living in a human life, there were real limits of finitude on him. He related with, the, with some of these people to the expense of relating with others. There were costs here. Investing in 12 disciples meant investing less in others. Taking the three with him at various moments meant others missed out. But it also meant that he could invest more in those disciples than he could by trying to be relationally equitable. There was something valuable about that. That said, again, I don't think this was Jesus' kind of clever ministry strategy. It wasn't his kind of like plan to, like Im to make the biggest impact with the least amount of energy. <laughs> Before he calls his 12 disciples, the Gospels tell us that Jesus went away and he prayed. Selecting 12 and selecting these 12 was what the Father was doing. Jesus' relational focus was the natural consequence of his spiritual focus. His focus in prayer, living his life before his and our Heavenly Father. Giving God the Father control of his relationships, he, he was able to see what God might do in and through them. Back when I was, um, back when I was an undergraduate at Yale, um, at the end of a, a meeting of the Yale Christian Fellowship, uh, a Divinity School student came up to me and introduced himself to me. Now, um, I, I, I don't remember much about that first encounter, um, but I remember that it happened. 
And you know, we, we would start to connect from time to time. He just kind of introduced himself, to, to himself, told me his name, and uh, we'd keep in touch. We, from time to time, we'd, we'd lose, we'd lose uh, contact, but uh, you know, here and there, and we developed a friendship. Over the years, um, big changes happened in our life. I got married, he got married. I remember getting actually an invitation to his wedding and actually being a little bit puzzled. Uh, frankly, I thought I was too cool to hang out, or he was, sorry, I thought he was too cool for me to, so no. <laughs> I have never been too cool to hang out with anyone. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this man is delusional. <laughs> um, no, I, I just thought like, oh my, this, this is like one of the cool kids. Like, you know, it's kind of why I thought like we kind of go in and out of touch. <laughs> I thought, like, you know, there's no reason. And I kind of got invited to his wedding, I thought, ah. Oh. Okay, yeah, I mean, it sounds great. Uh, he asked me to play piano. I thought, oh, okay, maybe I was just, maybe I was just there to play the piano. I don't know. Um, but w we started to kind of get connected a little bit more. And I started Divinity School, and he and actually overlapped in our time as students. And I discovered that he, too, was a musician, a worship leader. And we started leading worship together, and then we started leading a home group together. And eventually, the home group kept growing and growing, and we started asking, what is God doing here? What is the Father doing you know the rest of the story. Ultimately, we discerned that God was planting a church and calling us, Caleb, his, and his wife, Kathy, and Hannah and me, to pastor this church that God was planting. Nine years later, here we all are. But somewhere in the midst of all of that, Caleb um, kind of confessed something to me. He told me that uh, during that first meeting of the Yale Christian Fellowship, where he saw me up front uh, hacking away probably at a guitar, um, he said that, um, that God had kind of highlighted me and kind of told Caleb, he said, you should be friends with that guy. I always wondered why someone that cool was hanging out with me. It, it, it would have taken divine intervention. As it turned out, it did <laughs> actually take divine intervention. Um, but he took that as something really weighty, something really important, and he took it seriously. And as a result of that obedience, right, and all the cards that started to fall, fall, and all the other sorts of things that we started to do, and the consistently asking this question, Father, what are you doing? That's why we're in this room here today. It's crazy, right? What might happen if you invited God to speak into your relationships? To see what the Father is doing in your network of friends? To ask God to highlight a relationship for which God has plans? What would it mean to do that in your neighborhood with people you're still getting to know? It's kind of an awkward thing, right? It made some sort of sense in um, kind of a relational network. Um, but we're talking about loving these people that, you know, your neighbors, the ones that live in houses near yours. Actually, I think Jesus com commands those 70 disciples I mentioned before to do something very much like this when he sends them out as his advanced team. He sends them to, as Josh described last week, to practice the art of receiving the hospitality of those to whom he was sending them. It's a kind of crazy, risky thing to do, and Jesus doubles down to make sure that they'll be dependent on their host. He forbids the 70 to take extra supplies that might allow them to be self-sufficient. And like I said, this is Jesus' big endorsement of the art of receiving as a mode of loving our neighbors. But Jesus also advised these disciples that as they moved into their new, new neighborhoods, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Okay, so first admission. This passage is a little bit confusing. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't have a great instinctive sense of what it feels like for my peace to re return to me or, or what it would feel like for it to rest on someone. Um, I, and I'm not going to give you a, a, a wonderful solution to that right now. But given, but given that peace is one of the classic markers of God's kingdom, of what the Father is doing, I take it that in some sort of way, that I, this must be spiritually discerned, we're looking for some sort of resonance with what God is doing in the world. That the peace that we go to share, we actually find resonating with the person we encounter. And so this person of peace, we might say, is this person in our neighborhood with whom there is a resonance between their work or their heart's desires and what God is doing in the world. This is the person Jesus instructs his disciples to focus on relationally. 
just stay there. He actually says move in with them. Um, that might be an intense sort of way to do your neighboring um, if you want. Um, but you, you kind of already have moved in with them, I think would be the way to think about this. You've moved into this neighborhood. Maybe you moved in 20 years ago, but the point is you're there, right? And you're there with these people. And, 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 and Jesus' advice is to say when you find this person, this is a place to focus. It's a place where God's already at work. God's gone ahead of you. In your, in your, you know, and, that, and that's good news because some of us uh, haven't been on this neighboring thing uh, like we could have been um, from the start. But I take it that this is part of the wisdom in this exercise that Josh has commended to us. As we've been, if you haven't seen this diagram yet, there are extras in the back. You can fill one out. It's, just, it's been a, become a kind of tool for us to think intentionally about the neighbors to whom God has called us. These people who actually physically live near us. And Josh asks us to think through kind of um, getting to know these people with kind of three different layers, if, if you will. Um, first, it would be good to just know these people's names. Uh, that seems like common courtesy and a good way to go. Um, but you, we might also, as we got to know our neighbors, want to know about their daily work. What are they up to during the days? And third, we might start to really, if we really want to love our neighbors, we're going to need, at least with some of our neighbors, to get to the point where we're actually talking with them about their dreams, we were able to understand and relate to them about these dreams and maybe share our own. I take it that at the second level, and certainly at the third level, this is where we can start to get to the point where we can start to recognize these people of peace in our neighborhoods. Not that, that it's ever too early to start praying, God, what are you doing? I think, take it we should do that. God may well highlight someone uh, for us before we have evidence to understand why, um, like God did with Caleb in my first encounter. I don't think there was anything particularly impressive and awesome about me where he was like, aha, that's the guy. God can just speak to us. But I think as we get to know our neighbor's dreams, we might, we more and more get a glimpse of what God has already been doing before we showed up on the scene. And living in this sort of person of peace sort of way, this sort of posture, I think often we can end up being quite surprised by whom God highlights, on whom God's peace rests. It may not be the friend you thought you'd make. It may not be the person your age or in your life stage among your neighbors. That just may not be the person to whom God has called you in this season, the person most like you. This may not be the relationship on which God would have you focus. Often what God is doing is below the surface. And so as we learn to love our neighbors better, we do well to pray this prayer, God, what are you doing? And to also um, be listening to our neighbors with that same question in mind. So we're having a conversation, even asking God in that moment, God, what are you, what are you doing in this, in this, what are you doing here? I shared a, few, a couple of weeks, about, uh, weeks ago about a neighbor of ours who, uh, when we moved in, uh, he kind of identi identified himself as a musician, and I'm something of a musician, and I thought, all right, bam, this is, this is my guy. Like, th th this is, and, and we've had some good, good conversations, as I shared with you. There was a, a, another neighbor across the street who, um, to be totally honest, um, when I kind of first interacted with her, I just kind of thought, this is like, this is, this is like an old, like a lonely old woman. Like I don't, I don't know how much I'm gonna have in common with her. She like lives alone in a kind of big house across the street. Um, I, I don't know. And whenever I'd pray that God would um, kind of do something in my relationship with my neighbors, I would expect that it would be with my musician neighbor. And I kind of pray, God, what, you know, would you kind of open doors for us with our neighbors? Or maybe our neighbors who live right downstairs, we share a building with them. That's a good, that's a, that'd be a natural place to start. Again, not that God hasn't done things in those relationships, but often when I would pray that prayer, the opportunity I would get would be to have a long conversation with my neighbor across the street. Like, what is going on with this? And so I, I started to get Get to know her. Honestly, like, um, if you heard what I confessed a couple weeks ago, you know, I, I'm not the most patient person or kind of hopeful for these sorts of conversations. So it was a little bit kicking and screaming. But as I started to get in these conversations, first of all, all right, she's a dog person. I'm a dog person, right? We can connect about dogs. Um, she had dogs. My daughter loves dogs. My daughter was, like, all about getting to pet the dogs, play with the dogs. 
Then I, and then I found out, I think, oh, that's interesting. You're part of, the, uh, you're part of a, a church community. Well, it's a Unitarian church, and she's a kind of Buddhist practitioner. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, I teach at the Divinity School. All right, we got a, something to talk about. But as we started, to, these conversations went on over months and years, as they can with your neighbors. That's one of the scary but exciting things about relating to your neighbors. I, I, she started to share more about her life. And she started to tell me about um, her life as a nurse. Um, she originally, uh, one of her kind of big moments, uh, she was just kind of working as a nurse in San Francisco, uh, in the, starting in the, I think in the late 70s into the early 80s. And she was working with uh, a population of men that suddenly found themselves right at the epicenter of a, of, of, of a new uh, outbreak of a disease. It was the beginning of the AIDS crisis. Nobody even had a name for it yet, but she was caring for these men, mostly, who were contracting this disease, and she was holding their hand and walking. She's telling these stories of walking with these men through the encounter with this really frightening, really frightening disease. Doctors couldn't tell them what they had, but they saw their friends dying. Um, and she was a nurse right there in what essentially became the first AIDS clinic in America. And as I'm listening to this, a couple of things come up. One, one is, like, this woman has buried some of the most significant relationships in her life. And she's not alone. She's not, I, I, she's not a lonely old lady. She does live alone. And it put, it put a little bit of context for me, right? That if I, when I get to know this woman, I learn her story and about how she, she gave a lot to people who couldn't pay her back because she had good reason to believe she was going to outlive them, outlive them all. And the second thing that, that struck me was, oh my goodness, talk about the heart of God, right? Uh, to give without expecting in return, to invest your life, to hold, she would multiple times, tell me about like holding the hands, right, of these men at a time when there were a lot of misinformation about um, how AIDS could be contracted. These were not people who were being cared for in that sort of way. And so I, I, I have learned so much actually about God's heart for people from my conversations with this neighbor, and she has undoubtedly become a person of peace in our life on Dyer Street. Let me be clear. Um, you know, identifying a person of peace, I take it, doesn't mean ignoring your other neighbors. Um, it certainly doesn't mean a judgment against your other neighbors. But I think what it can mean is daring to focus our energies as Jesus did. Um, and like I said, I think that's hard for our lives in general, and maybe particularly hard when it comes to relationships. But I think it's just another instance where there will be great fruit of living in line with what we see our Heavenly Father doing, uh, in this case, in and among our neighbors. So we have a, just a, a few action steps uh, this afternoon. First thing I would suggest is... Um, Man, if you dare, um, pray that prayer. Um, I, I commend it to you. It, it's kind of like an all-purpose. I have yet to find a, a situation in which this is not a prayer worth praying. Um, so I would commend it to you. Um, pray, God, what are you doing? Um, and maybe you might even, uh, in the spirit of this neighboring series, uh, look at your neighborhood and say, God, what are you doing here? Because when you, when you attach the here then it starts to get actionable, right? And it's like right here, what are you doing? In, in that spirit, you might return to that kind of block map that we've been using and you might ask, um, who are the people of peace? Maybe you already know. And as I've been talking, you're like, oh, that's what's going on with that, <laughs> with that one relationship. I didn't understand why God kept bringing that person across my path. Maybe this is a person of peace that God's highlighting for me. Or maybe you've gotten to know one of your neighbor's visions and dreams, and maybe they're not following Jesus, but there's, boy, there's something of the kingdom already happening in their lives that you're learning from and you're interacting with them about. Who are the people of peace? And third is, you know, um, connect with those people. <laughs> um, I, we've been talking about all, all, all through this series about different ways, you know, I, I don't, maybe we do have to learn again how to be friends. 
go and try to intentionally have a conversation. <laughs> um, go hunting for Pokemon in their backyard, whatever you need to do. Um, invite them for, to over to your place for coffee. Hold a movie night. Make sure they're invited. Seek out these people. Um, it's a, I take it this is a small microcosm of a larger way of life. A way of life that says, I, I want to do what the Father is doing. I want to do what God is doing. All right. I'm going to invite the worship team uh, to come forward as we uh, turn the corner to um, worship and prayer and communion. We're just going to respond to what God's doing in this place. And, um, you know, God can be doing different things in, in each one of us as we're kind of in a space like this. We're considering who God is and what he, what God might be doing in our lives and how, he, how God might be shaping us, calling us in different ways. Um, but the first way we're going to respond is, is uh, through communion. Um, and in, in communion, we, we, we remember um, Jesus' uh, gift to us of himself, of his laying down his life uh, for us whom he calls his friends, for you whom he calls his friend. And so if you're a follower of Jesus or if you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, I invite you as the band begins uh, to lead us in worship to come forward and to tear off a piece of the bread, uh, Christ's body broken for you, and to dip it in the cup, his blood shed for you. Just as an opportunity of saying, we want to be doing what the Father's doing. Doing what the Father was doing is what led Jesus ultimately to the cross. It also led him to be raised on the third day and led him to the right hand of the Father. So Holy Spirit, would you come and would you give us courage to pray this prayer that Jesus prayed? God, what are you doing? Would you open our eyes to the things that you're doing here in our midst right now? Would you open our eyes to the things that you're doing in our neighborhoods, in our places of work? And would you give us the courage to, to walk into those things? To seek out your goodness in the places where you are already hard at work. Come and have your way.